thank you for the invitation. It's a very interesting meeting. Uh, unfortunately, I am in the US, so it's hard for me to watch the whole meeting. It started at 3 a.m. But I did manage to wake up early before six, and uh, it was exciting to watch a little frozen off by, in my iPhone while uh, I was showering in the morning. Uh, yeah, maybe that didn't sound very right. <laughs> One has to be careful today. But uh, anyway, it has been a very interesting talk and it's a very interesting video. And I'm gonna be talking about gene therapy for uh, mitochondrial DNA disease with some emphasis on meganuclease as Valeria mentioned. So as you all know, and I hope you can see my mouth here, uh, mitochondrial disorders can affect different organs, as we know. Um, for example, neurons are commonly affected. And uh, it can be caused by defects in nuclear DNA, and we saw some examples of that, but also uh, defects in the mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA is present in multiple copies inside the mitochondria. And when you have a mutation, very often you have mutant and wild-type mitochondrial DNA coexisting. That's a condition known as mitochondrial heteroplasma, as you also well know. So for many years, we've been trying to uh, alter this heteroplasm, trying to get rid of the mutant mitochondrial DNA here in red and uh, leaving the wild-type mitochondrial DNA there that could compensate for the, for the defect. And the approach that uh, we and others have been taking is to use specific nucleases that can be targeted to the mitochondria and uh, hopefully be specific enough that they can cut the, the mutant mitochondrial DNA, but not the wild type. So to do that, we have to add a uh, targeting sequence to the nuclease. So it goes to the mitochondria and then it can uh, cleave the mitochondrial DNA and leave the wild type mitochondrial DNA alone. And this will replicate now uh, and, and make up for the difference. I think this presentation is on a timer, so I'm gonna have to be careful here. Okay, so we have been using uh, an in, in, endonuclease or gene editing platform, those known as Stalin's. And as Carlos Visconti was uh, mentioning very briefly, he has collaborated with a group of uh, Michal Michuk uh, in England, and they use uh, zinc finger nucleases targeted to mitochondria. So there are different platforms that can be used. And the Stalin's, they, they bind to the DNA as dimers, and they cleave uh, the mitochondrial DNA because they have the DNA binding domain. So I'm gonna have a problem with this timer here. and I cannot stop the timer. Sorry, let me try to... Okay, I can use these arrows here. And uh, so there's a DNA binding domain and a nuclease domain that cleaves the DNA. And these proteins are relatively large and they work as dimers, but they're still quite specific because they recognize a lot of DNA sequences use these arrows here. Okay, so using this approach uh, in culture, we have uh, targeted different mitochondrial DNA mutations, like the common deletion, uh, a mutation in ND6 that has been associated with Labor's dystonia, uh, a tRNA mutation associated with MERV, and uh, uh, another protein coding mutation associated with MELA. But we also wanted to try to develop this approach in vivo. So we use a mouse model that was developed by Jim Stewart uh, and Niels Larson, uh, the Max Planck, that has a point mutation in a tRNA alanine gene. And these mice, they really don't have a strong phenotype. When they get uh, old, they have a bit of a cardiomyopathy, but it's a very mild phenotype. So what Sandra Bachman in the lab did was to develop talents uh, that are specific for this mutation. And uh, then as Carlo mentioned, we used uh, AZ9 to 
to deliver this mitotalent to tissues that is AAV would infect. And uh, in our case, we're very interested in skeletal mass. And as a control, we injected an AV9 expressing only GFP. The way we inject was retroorbitally, that's a sinus behind the eye that drains directly into the venous system. So it's like an IV injection. Okay, so just this is, has been published a while back. So just to give a brief summary, uh, when the, uh, and this is not the, the retroorbital injection, this was intramuscular injection. So here, when Sandra injected the leg, the right leg or the left leg, and uh, the uh, right leg was injected with mitotalin and the left leg with the GFP. You can see in the right leg, uh, the amount of mutant went down very specifically. And this is the quantification and here's the average. So four, six, 10, 12, 24 weeks after injection, uh, we had uh, a reduction in mutant mitochondrial DNA. Now, besides muscle, we are also interested in the CNS because again, as Carlo mentioned, is one of the most affected tissues in mitochondrial disease. And uh, the vector of uh, interest, or at least the most useful, is AAV. AAV uh, is non-pathogenic and can deliver genes to a number of different tissues. And thank you, Carlo, also for giving an introduction to this, that uh, the specificity of the tissues can vary depending on the capsid of the virus and the different selection systems have been uh, used to identify different capsids. And one of which uh, Carlo mentioned was PHPB. And this is another variant that's called PHPEB that again, for that specific mouse strain, was good in delivering genes to the central nervous system. So because we were interested in uh, neuronal expression, even though mitochondrial disorders can affect different cells, but we want to see the effect in neurons, we tried different promoters for, for this gene therapy. So there was a chicken bet acutin promoter, a synapsin promoter, and CMG promoter. So attached to GFP, uh, we made viruses and Sandra injected in different mice, again, intravenous. And here we see the hippocampus and other parts of the brain. And the expression in the Western blot of GFP was very strong with the synapsin promoter, also with a beta actin promoter, uh, not so good with CMV promoter. And that is not surprising. So because again, we, we were curious to see how was the neuronal expression, we decided to proceed our studies with the synapsin promoter. And here is a more pathological view of neurons expressing the GFP and co with the new N, that's a neuronal mark. But again, not every neuron expressed, and this is important, I'm gonna come back to that. So here, what Sandra did was to inject, again, uh, Talon's work as dimers. So you have the two monomers, one for one side of the binding site and other for the other side. One of them had a GFP uh, separated with the T2A, so you could express these two proteins. And these were injected in mice. And again, the control was the GFP with the same promoter, synopsin promoter. These mice were injected uh, 18 days of life and then they'll uh, analyze at six, 12, and actually 24 weeks as well that we're doing right now. So here's a Western blot at six weeks, and you see that there is a flag tag in our gene, and we can see expression in the brain, uh, cortex, cerebellum, hippocampus, even the spinal cord, so uh, not as much in other tissues. Uh, and you know that's not surprising now because it's not only the delivery, but the promoter that we're using is neuronal specific. Um, so that's one monomer, that's the other monomer. One has a flag tag, the other has an HA tag. So what Sandra observed was a change in heteroplasmy. Again, so there was a, a loss of the mutant mitochondrial DNA. Uh, 
And in red, we have mice injected with the HPV mitotalin, and in green, with the GFP. And even though there was a decrease, uh, was less than what we're used to seeing in muscle, uh, was about 20%, cortex, hippocampus, here's the rest of the brain. And we thought, well, maybe, you know, with time, uh, as this expression keeps going on, we're gonna have a bigger shift in heteroplasm. So Sandra started analyzing at 12 weeks, and in fact, it was pretty much the same. And she's doing it 24 weeks now, and it's looking like that's gonna be about the same. So, you know, we have this, I think cortex about 20% or so, uh, give or take a change in heteroplasm. That can be very significant phenotypically, but, you know, would be happier if we had more of a change. Now, maybe this 20% change is really not surprising if we look at the pattern of expression uh, in, in the brain. So here you can see this is a DAPI that stains the nucleus or the nuclei. And here is uh, the GFP of the mitotalin itself. So that's that monomer that had the GFP. And you see that not only, you know, glial cells, for example, not express, but also some neurons do not express. And you can see here the dark spot. So that's why uh, even waiting more time, we're not gonna, probably not gonna see more change in heteroplasm because the, the neurons that receive the mitotalin change quite a bit. And the other cells, glial cells, and neurons that did not get the virus, uh, did not. And with time, probably they won't. So that's one of the challenges. And uh, it was very interesting to have Carlos talk uh, before because uh, I think that's, that's the challenge we have that not every cell will get it with AV. Uh, and of course, titers matter, uh, but maybe, you know, we have some, we need an AV that's uh, more specific, self-complementary, make expression faster, but still we have more cells to, to express. And I think that would be key. Right now, titer is the only thing we can play with to have more cells express. And it's difficult to get very high titer for, for in vivo application. All right, so now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, a different platform, uh, a different gene editing platform that's called ARCOS. And this has been done in collaboration with Precision Bioscience, that's a biotech company in North Carolina. And uh, uh, this is the group that we've been collaborating with. And again, sorry for the timer. And uh, Wendy is the one that has been more closely uh, working with us now, and actually she's doing a, a PhD right now with the University of Miami in Precision Bioscience. So what is ARCUS? ARCUS is a homing endonuclease from Chlamydomonas that's actually quite small, even though it also works as a homodimer. And they recognize a 22 base pair double strand uh, sequence in, in, in Chlamydomonas. So what uh, precision scientists did was to put these two monomers together with a linker. And also they found how uh, use the amino acids that bind to the DNA to change uh, in a somehow modular way so that they could have new recognition sequences. And uh, it became a gene editing platform because you can recognize pretty much any sequence right now. And that's the pipeline they use at uh, precision they have first in silico design and then direct evolution to generate uh, not only a first generation, but also other generations uh, after optimizing this DNA binding site. That's for example, one of the approaches they use during this pipeline. They have a Chinese hamster ovary cell that has a broken GFP and they put the site of interest between these broken pieces and if the gene editing enzyme cuts it, then they can recombine and form GFP. So for example, here we have a, a mutant target. And in this case, we want to develop an enzyme against the mouse mutation, the tRNA alanine. So that target was placed here in the, in the nucleus of this Chinese hamster over its cells. And, uh, and the nuclease was generated and it could cleave the mutant very well, but could not cleave the wild type sequence. And that uh, ARCOS was called MEET 1112. There's a control site, and this is what's showing here, 
that you always do to make sure that every sequence you put still cuts. So a, that site still cuts. So once this <clears throat> article was developed, they sent it to us and uh, a student in the lab, Ugna, uh, put a flag tag and the mitochondrial localization signal so that this arcos became a mito arcos and it went to the mitochondria. And uh, Ugna started the experiment with a cell line. So this is a cell line introspected here. And we are analyzing the levels of mutant and wild type by PCR and restriction fragment length polymorphism. So that's about 50% mutant, this cell line. So she transfected with this mito arcos and co-transfected with GFP and sorted cells that were uh, green. So usually they have uh, the mito arcos and then analyze the so-called black cells and the green cells. And the heteroplasm, you can see that there is a lot more wild type in the green cells because we lost the mutant ones. And that's another experiment. Now, this cell line was not very uh, phenotypically affected because it had a lot of wild type. So we're gonna develop another cell line with a collaboration with other people in the lab uh, that had very little of the wild type and now treated the cells and you know it was almost 100% mutant, but still that little bit increased, as you can see here in the green cell population. So the idea was not to do in culture cells, but in the mouse. So we got this mitoarcos and put into an AAV9 vector. Again, the idea being that uh, skeletal muscle, heart, uh, and as you see, other tissues will get well transduced with AAV9. So again, uh, uh, intravenously, they were uh, injected and we waited six, 12 or 24 weeks and uh, used that mouse model that was heteroplasmic for the tRNA alanine mutation. And uh, after these times, we analyzed these different tissues. So here we have a Western blot showing the expression of the mitoarcos, as you remember, uh, there's a flag tag, and uh, you see heart, the tibialis anterior, quadriceps, gastronemius, they have the expression, the GSP as well. Liver that has some expression, but not a lot. And here is the analysis of the mutation. And you can see that uh, the muscles got more wild type compared to, let's say, brain that did not express the enzyme. The liver really changed completely. It lost all the mutant mitochondrial DNA. And it was kind of surprising because the expression in liver was not as high as we saw in, in muscle, for example. And of course, when we inject GFP, nothing changed. All the tissues keep the same heteroplasm. Well, what happens with liver is that liver uh, gets transduced very well with AV9, but very early. So soon after the injection, you have liver expressing a lot, and then with time it loses. And that might also explain some of uh, Carlos' results. Anyways, so we injected again mice and analyzed now after only five days. And by Western blood, we saw very high expression in liver and pretty much nothing in, in skeletal muscle. So uh, that's why liver changed heteroplasm so fast. So this is a summary of the results. The mice that were injected early at about 16, 18 days, liver changed completely. So here we're seeing loss of the mutant mitochondrial DNA. And uh, at six weeks, 12 and 24, you can see that the skeletal muscles, different ones, uh, and heart a little bit less, lost the mutant mitochondrial DNA as well. Now, if we inject the mice a little older at 42 days, actually a lot, older, they're considered an adult, uh, we still see liver changing completely and muscle also changing, but a lot less. And that's another uh, concern that we have with AAV is that if you inject young mice and probably young humans as well, they're gonna have a much better transduction than if you inject uh, older adults. Again, it's another challenge that we have to, to overcome. This is just showing that uh, liver, even though you have that uh, change in heteroplasmy very early, uh, you can see here, we don't have 
uh, toxicity. We don't have uh, liver damage. So here is looking at a marker of liver regeneration or a marker of apoptosis. So even though liver gets a lot of virus, still there is no, no damage there. And if my final data results, I think time is about right. And we analyze the levels of the tRNA element. So this particular mutation, it causes an instability of the tRNA element, the mitochondrial tRNA element. So that's what the knockout has. So here we compare the mice that were also the, I mean, the heteroplasmic mice that were injected with the GFP, with the mitoarchus, and we can see that the levels of tRNA alanine uh, were restored. This is a, a RT-PCR assay for small RNAs that also corroborate higher level of TR, tRNA alanine and normalized to another mitochondrial tRNA. So in conclusion, uh, the mitotalin can reduce mutant mitochondrial DNA load in the CNS, uh, but with the caveats that uh, we're not hitting too many neurons. Uh, Mitoarcos is a new platform for gene editing that can reduce the levels of mutant mitochondrial DNA in muscle and leaf. Now, I didn't emphasize before, but the big advantage of Mitoarcos is that it has a small size and it's a monomer. So it's a lot easier to deliver in an AAV and to pack in an AAV than mitotalin or even uh, mito uh, think finger nucleates, for example. So this is, we consider a big uh, advantage of mitoarcos. So further optimization, this approach could lead to a safe and effective treatment for heteroplasmic mitochondrial DNA disease. Again, barriers I discussed before is still, I think is delivered. Another barrier that we can discuss more is if uh, there's a lot of mutants and you get rid of them very quickly, you can have a depletion of mitochondrial DNA. So one has to be careful with that. And we have been addressing this issue. And for example, you can reduce uh, the kinetics of the, of the enzyme to cut a little slower, for example. So there are ways to, to potentially deal with that. So I just want to thank the people that did the work. Sandra Ugna did most of the work that I described here and Claudia helped but the whole lab uh, helped in one way or another uh, with this project. Our collaborators at uh, Precision, um, in particular Derek that we started this collaboration with and Wendy that's doing a lot of work and doing a lot of exciting things in this, uh, in this area right now. Uh, Jim and also Niels, but Jim now that uh, we've been uh, doing more work more recently with his uh, mouse models and the funding agency. And thank you very much. I'll stop here. And sorry again for the timer. I forgot to eliminate.